Hi, um, my name is Ann Gallivan. I am an interviewer today for Lessons of the Sixties, a project of documenting social justice organizing in the Washington, D.C. area uh, from 1960 to 1975. Um, today our camera person will be Bonnie Rowan, who is a member of our uh, steering committee, and also asking questions and interviewing will be Anka Decker. All three of us are on the steering committee of this project that we're talking about. Now, um, today's the 16th of February 2017, and we are looking at the papers of and life of James Stockard, who was a leading civil rights advocate uh, in, in Arlington, Virginia, from in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And we have with us um, his three children. Would you introduce yourselves? Yes, I'm Janet Demerod, and I was in the school system for the 12 exact years that my father was on the school board. So I started in 1955, one year after Brown versus Board of Education, and I graduated from the public school system in 1967, all of it in Arlington County. And I'm Ruth Stockard Flynn, and I also went to Arlington Public Schools for my entire career, but I'm way older than my dear sister. <laughs> And I'm James G. Stockard, Jr., or Jim, um, Dad's uh, only son, uh, and I spent my entire career in the, in the Arlington County Public Schools as well. I'm the oldest of all of us. <laughs> <laughs> now, why, why, did your, why is your dad such an important figure in this historical period? Tell us briefly. Well, briefly, he was um, extremely interested in public education all of his life. Uh, and uh, having been involved in PTA movement in Arlington, he was asked by uh, one of the two uh, non-national parties that operated within Arlington County, ABC and AIM. He was asked by ABC to be a candidate for the school committee in 1955, began serving in 1956, just after the Board of Education, uh, Brown versus Board of Education decision. Um, and he ran, as did all the ABC people, on a, on a platform of implementing Brown versus Board of Education and became the de facto and strategic leader of that effort for the next 12 years. Um, and so um, we, his children, and I think many other people in Arlington consider him uh, one of the important figures uh, in uh, moving past that block in our, in our national history. That election that you're referring to, the campaign and election, that was 1955 when he ran, and that was a nasty election, wasn't it? A nasty campaign. It, it really was. Can you was. talk about that a little bit? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I can remember as kids, our family was very involved um, politically. It, the politics was what was talked about around the table. So when Dad ran, we were also very involved. We were slapping up posters in the middle of the night on poles over the ones they'd slapped up the night before, and it, it was hard fought. But we also realized that what was going on here, because we, you know, watched TV and read national newspapers, is that in many parts of the country, um, governments were resisting Brown versus Board of Ed or judges were making orders, but here was a community that was going to vote on it. They had a really clear-cut decision, and they were going to vote on it. And so that's why this seemed like such an important election. I'm, I was a little bit young at that point, <laughs> but I can remember gathering in a church where all of the members of the Arlingtonians for, better, for a better county, ABC, right. and was there in the the precincts would call in the results in each uh, in each vote, and uh, we little a group of us little kids would be in the basement, and the, the the folks would give us a little chit with the number on it, and we would run it up the stairs to where all of the uh, members of it and all of the supporters were, and we would hand it to the guy, and he would put it on the board, uh, and everybody would cheer. So we felt we had a very important role, at least. Yeah. <laughs> this has been a staple of our lives. We always sat in front of the party conventions every year and the television made notes of which state had cast which electoral votes and who was getting the nomination and so on and so forth. So we were very used to political life being an important part of our the conversations in our household. And for Dad to be a candidate was doubly exciting. That was very, very cool. Um, and added to that, it had certainly become an issue by that point of not just us versus them, but an issue of important moral content for our community. And our dad, uh, 
was on the right side <laughs> of that moral issue. <laughs> and so there was even more pride. It was fairly clear from the slate of people nominated by ABC uh, which of the candidates that ABC had nominated would be the mo would get the most votes, um, and which would get the second. Dad was pretty clearly the third candidate, less well known around the county than mm -hmm. the other two were. So the question of whether he could get more votes than the best candidate from the other party was a constant conversation in our house, and so mm -hmm. it was it was gratifying that that happened. So that's the way the election worked that everyone voted for who they wanted, and then the people who got the most votes, whether whatever group they came from, that's right. Right. became that's the school right. board. That's right. Because of the Hatch Act, you weren't allowed to run with party slates, with major you know, political party slates, mm -hmm. because government employees were not permitted to be involved in, in uh, local politics, and everybody that lived in Arlington was a government employee. <laughs> so these other community groups formed, and, and as you say, that was, that was the uh, f facility of the voting. It was just, and some, there was an independent, at least one, I think, who maybe thought so. about running, who could, maybe, might have also gotten seat. So it wasn't clear until the end of the evening that the win had happened. It certainly could have been possible that there were, there were I believe, two AIM members that, whose terms had not expired at that right. point. Right, so, AIM. I'm sorry, AIM is the Arlington Independent Movement. Right. That was the somewhat more conservative group of, uh, of candidates, and Arlington's for a Better County, as Janet said, was the more liberal group of those groups. But certainly likely that the final results could have been two ABC and one AIM, in which case on the overall board, AIM would still have been in charge. Mm -hmm. So it was a big victory that all three ABC people were elected, and therefore the, the tenor of the board would change in the direction of integrating our schools. Do you think it was any, um, was, was it um, related, uh, this, this later thing that, that uh, elected boards of education, uh, how do I want to say this? Didn't the Virginia legislature ban yes. elected school boards yes. after your dad won? Was that a coincidence or not? <laughs> Tell us not, that not story. Tell us that story. Yeah. <laughs> not, not at all a coincidence. Yeah. I, <laughs> you want to start? Uh, I understand less about it, but it, I think than, than maybe the two of you who are older. But I do know that later on, the Virginia legislature passed something after my father died, mm -hmm. saying that yes. they were wrong. That's right. And that James Stockard should be honored for that work, and having removed the elected uh, school board facility from Arlington was, uh, and having them appointed by Richmond was not the way to go. Am I correct on that? Uh, yep, absolutely. You'll remember that in those days, Harry Byrd was in charge of politics in Virginia. I don't remember in those days whether he was still a senator or he was sort of in retirement, but, but yeah. pulling the strings from behind the scenes. Um, and uh, there were clear statements by him that, that if people are going to be like those people in Arlington are, then we're going to have to not elect school boards anymore. Uh, it was a very direct response to, to Arlington electing three progressive people um, uh, in the midst of massive resistance, which already existed as a policy in Virginia after right. Brown versus Board of Education. And, and that was, I think, was uh, their public rationale for it. Well, well, you know, we have this statewide policy of massive resistance, and we have this rogue board up there, you know, in Arlington, which is going another way. They're going to involve us in lawsuits. It'll cost a lot of money, you know, da 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 da, da. And Dad was one of the ones. Dad was from Texas with if he wanted to, a southern accent. Didn't always want to, but now and then he could come up with a southern accent. And so he was sent to argue, it was the Moncure bill which was going to do this, and he was sent to argue in the state legislature in favor of leaving the elected board in Arlington. And while I think he made a, no doubt, an effective argument, sure. uh, out went the elected board. So no more elected school board, although the people who had been elected, this was soon after they were elected, and the people who had been elected were permitted to serve the rest of their term. So he and the other two ABC candidates completed their term. How long? Four-year terms, right? Well, Dad served for 12 years. Four and there year, were three four terms. Year terms for three four-year terms. And somewhere in the middle there, prior to the Moncure, I think, was when the massive assist resistance had taken traction. And the... Uh, as chairman of the board, he was subpoenaed to go into federal district court and explain right. why uh, Arlington was dragging their feet on 
implementing the law of the land, Brown versus Board of Education. And my father, I kind of, as a kid, I thought, oh, that's scary to go into court, but he loved it. Yeah. I think that oh, yeah. was one of the yeah. major annoyances to Richmond was that he would, he would give the votes. Well, we're trying, but these three people on the board have voted against it. At that point, the AIM had the majority, but he was still chairman. He was yeah. still, even with the, them in, in the seats of the majority. Right. So he was naming names on votes and everything, and that, I think, was What What the, what the like state it. did was it, it uh, decided that from that point forward, school boards would be appointed by the county boards. Um, from ABC's point of view, that's just fine because they could concentrate all their effort on controlling the county board. Uh -huh. And so Dad's second and third terms were as, as, a, as an appointed member of the board by the Arlington County Board. But I think there was one of those times when the, the more liberal political group did not have control and right. yet he was appointed. Still. Because the thing about Dad was, you knew where he stood, right? Yeah. And, and it, it, they were willing to have him be one vote out of four, which he oh so often was. So, but he was honest and thought of, you know, very highly by people on both sides, even that disagreed with him. So he got appointed even when they didn't have the majority. Right. What do you think was your dad's motivation, original motivation for this kind of brave action? We talked about that a little earlier. Um, it's a little hard to know. I ask him that, but my great advantage, um, and maybe Ruth's as well, um, but I was just old enough in the important parts of this story, in the beginning of this story, that Dad would talk to me about strategy and about what he was trying to do and so on. And, and I learned some very profound political lessons from those conversations. And I would ask him about, how'd you do this? I mean, remember, he grew up in a cotton farming Texas town um, where when we visited every summer, uh, all every time uh, uh, an African-American was referred to, and there was quite a community because they all worked on the cotton farms, mm -hmm. but they were always referred to with a possessive uh, uh, foreground, right? That guy over there is Carl Stockard's blank. Yeah. Oh, that's Joe Brown's blank. Um, and so that's the context in which he grew up. Um, and it, every time I would ask him about this, all he would say was, this is just the right way for human beings to react with each other. This is the right thing, so you have to do the right thing. And I think all of us have conjectured at one level or another that a big part of that came out of his faith. He was raised as a good old rock solid Southern Baptist. Um, uh, we were active members of a Southern Baptist church in Arlington um, where some bad things happened. Um, but uh, I think that a big part of this was that Dad had memorized all those Bible stories. Yep. <laughs> and <laughs> Love your neighbor. <laughs> decided that that, was, that made sense. And it, that the right. Bible verse doesn't say, bring all the little children to me except the black ones. <laughs> uh, and so I think this was in some great part um, his religious upbringing. Um, well, he, he said it once either in an article or, or to me directly that he had had two, I think it was in an interview he did with Ed Campbell, who turned out to be the lawyer on some of the major cases for Arlington later on. But in this interview with Ed Campbell, he said, well, I had two criteria when I got ready to take a vote. What would Jesus do? And what would Thomas Jefferson do? And if I could satisfy both of those, then that's where I was going to vote. But you remember what happened at the church more distinctly than we do because yeah. we were gone. Yeah, um, Dad was such a strategist and the white activists like himself and the black activists united in some of their activities to protest. And I could think of two, one, but the one at the church, Ruthie's talking about, so they, they had gone off to college, and I was going to church three times a, a week. We were really, really active players in the church. My father had been written out of the deaconship that he used to have because of his views in the school board. Um, both my mother and father's Sunday school classes had been removed from them. Um, but we were hanging in there, but my father always believed you work from within. So they got into uh, uh, play to to deciding to challenge the white church that we attended with having black activists um, 
collude to bring a family to the door to see if they could be seated. And the liberal deacons and members of the church wanted to just test it. And so when that family presented themselves, um, the deacons would not seat them, at which point all of the liberals got up, including me, my father took my hand. I didn't know what was going on. I think I was 13 years old or something. And out we marched down the aisle and never went back, never. Uh, so my father really felt that the churches had let down uh, the community with not taking an active role in desegregation or promoting integration. Um, he really felt that they were way in the dark ages. I want to ask you another question uh, about the 1955 campaign and election. Um, in the newspaper clippings that are in the your father's records, which you're donating to us today. Um, there are a lot of newspaper clippings with letters to the editor and then answers to back to them. 1955, and there was a particular group called the Defenders that took out ads and wrote letters and stuff like that um, against everything your dad was doing. Can you talk a little about who they were and how that, what their language was? Do you remember the any of that? They. It, uh, can you? Include the question in your answer. Yes. Oh, sure. Okay. The, the defenders, as I remember, were a group of ultra conservatives, mm -hmm. uh, and they would uh, put a during you know periods uh, of important votes and during the '55 campaign, they had an ad every single day in the local paper, and the ad would have a part of a quote, right? Just enough to make you think that they were the good guys mm -hmm. <laughs> and and so they they were just generally um, opposing any forward action and in favor and I know I don't I think they made themselves known who the individuals were but the ads in the newspaper were anonymous you didn't know exactly who these people were I was struck by some of the language that they that were in the letters and not the ads, as you said, but right. in the letters of people defending the defenders. Uh, right. Uh, and the language was the old stuff that didn't talk really about integration. It talked about states' rights and um, things like that. And those code that we now know that those are really code words for. Uh, you know, there were lots of code words during that time. Some of them um, they would talk about. Uh, not spending too much on a new school. Yeah. You know, let, let's just add to this ready tech school we've got here, you know, that one set of people's going to. Or um, we can't have buy another bus, you know. To, so a lot of them were framed mm -hmm. in fiscal or, you know, some other context than what they really were. I wonder what year it was that you left the church, that you walked out of the church, and what church your family went to after that. We went to no church after that. My father really lost heart with uh, organized religion. He was still a very spiritual person, he and my mother especially, but we did not attend a church after that. Um, and what year, I must have been about 12 or 13. So, uh, what does that make it? 61, 60, something like that? Something like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, 61, 62, yeah. right. Um, and I, I don't know if the Defenders were, is that the same as the neo-Nazi? No, that's no. different. Different, no. Groups. different groups. One of you that I talked to early on described something like that, the people coming into meetings. Right. Yeah. yeah. Can, you, can you recall do, that? Do you remember the story Dad would tell? Uh, no. Because I do. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Okay. No way. <laughs> it takes a village here. <laughs> We were raised as a village. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there was a story, and I think he told this story. Once, as we were beginning to have children, we would have family reunions that were sponsored by mom and dad to get all the cousins together. And he told this story to all his grandchildren. Once there was a meeting um, that was during the heat of, you know, shall we go ahead and, and go forward with our plan to integrate the schools? And the, there was a neo-Nazi party led by a, a man named Norman Lincoln Rockwell. George Lincoln. George. George. <laughs> George. Norman George. did pictures. George. George, George did hate. Right. <laughs> Sorry, Norman. <laughs> so, and Lincoln. And, and, and all those people. And, and so he had formed this, what we assumed to be a very small group of, of people that wore brown shirts, brown pants, and, you know, 
all the paraphernalia. He had a house in Arlington with swastikas point, painted on it and all that sort of thing. And he and his group came marching into a school board meeting one night when the board was sitting all in a row and there were chairs and they came, they walked with briefcases like this down the center of the aisle and sat on the row right across from the board and they put the briefcases on their laps and one of them made it be known that they knew how to work guns. So the, the fear of course was that that's what was in these briefcases. But the public meetings were a whole other set of issues that had to do with set, a lot of the issues that these people worked on didn't sound like they were integration issues, but they were. At public meetings in Arlington, blacks and whites could not sit on the same side. There was a black section and a white section. By law? By, by, law. Law. by law. state law. And so they decided, the black activists and the white activists decided that they wanted to challenge this and they needed a lawsuit to do it. But they didn't want to impose on one of their black activist friends because going to jail would be the result of violating this law and they didn't want to do that. So one of the white activist women went and sat on the black side, was arrested, had a lawsuit, now there were open meetings. Hmm. So it, it, there were just, you know, so many issues that played into it. As Janet has said, Dad was an ultimate strategist. One of those really important lessons I learned from him early on when when I realized he wasn't always making the motions that would that would take some new step. because. You should just know that after the school students were integrated, Dad immediately said, well, we can't integrate the students if we don't integrate the teachers, and we don't integrate the bus drivers, and we don't integrate the coaches, and we don't integrate the social events. And so he was always thinking about the next step of making this really a school system for everybody. But he was such a strategist that he would, he said to me, Jim, I've become a lightning rod. The minute I make a motion, everybody else on the board runs away. So what I have to do is I have to get somebody else to make the motion, and maybe somebody else even to second the motion, so I can just be the third vote to make it happen. I'm, but I'm 15. Dad, you won't get the credit for this. <laughs> and it's, it's old news now, but Dad, it was the first time I'd ever heard it. Jim, it doesn't matter who gets the credit. It's just getting the work done. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the goal, and you've got to figure out the best way to get the, to the goal without bothering about who gets the credit for it. Um, and so he would arrange for people, he would call up with Bruce Harmon's dad and say, Lindsay, I need you to come to the next meeting, I need you to get up and make a speech about X, Y, and Z. Because <laughs> we've, we've got an issue coming up and I think if somebody from the audience makes a big speech, I can move a third vote around on that one. And so Lindsay would show up and make a big, strong statement. Um, there was quite a network of people and uh, Sue and I, Sue, my wife and my sisters and I, um, um, had a circle of friends that included many parents who were very much a part of this movement. Um, so that um, my best friend, Carl, his parents were critical parts of this movement, they worked on the campaigns and we saw them at our house all the time. Uh, my future wife's parents were a critical part of this movement, uh, greatly respected by, by my they had campaign positions and worked hard and volunteered and so on and so forth. So we we had a bunch of friends who, and it's an interesting thing, I, at least in my experience, I don't know, I've never asked my sisters this question, I don't remember anybody in my high school experience, my, among my peer group, among my high school friends, saying to me, your rotten dad is just spoiling everything. Mm -hmm. The only comment I remember from friends of mine were, good for your dad, I, I like what he's doing, it's important for us to be doing that. Now, we self-select our friends, I understand that, so so partly I'm sure I self-selected people you know, that, that were going to reinforce my own views, but uh, did you guys ever have a critique from your friends? I did. Yeah, did I, and they weren't really friends, yeah. you know, as you say, you self-select your friends, but there were kids on the, the playground who would say my father was a, you know, in yeah. lover and so forth. There, there were ugly comments. Did you get any? You were young. I, I don't remember, but I do remember the threats um, yeah. on the family, mm -hmm. and the family, I yeah. think maybe I was a little more affected on that with right. you guys out. Um, at one point, Dad received a call saying, we know how your daughter walks to school. 
and I was going to Swanson Junior High School at that point, the middle school. And About it was, four blocks away? It wasn't, you know, it wasn't too far away, but I had to be followed for a couple of days by plain clothes when uh, <laughs> going to school, which we thought was really funny because they'd get there late and I'd be late to school, so we, <laughs> <laughs> we cut that out after two or three days of that. But, and, and we had threats like that, and of course, um, the major one being the cross being burned in the front yard, which was a major event. Um, what year was that? Jim and I were trying to figure out. Trying to figure it out, because we both remember it. Um, so he must have been in high school, and I would have been at the end of primary school. So mm -hmm. late 50s, 58, 59, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Also, my voice dropped fairly early, and I sounded a lot like Dad on the phone. So I would sometimes pick up the phone and would say, hello, and somebody would think, oh, I got stalkered, uh, meaning my dad. And then they would issue a long sort of invectives about all the evil stuff he was doing and how somebody was going to get him and so on and so forth. I, 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 I took a call like that a week, uh, you know, in, in the early years of this of this fight. Just Were again, you because my voice. Did that scare you? I don't recall that it scared me. I certainly always reported it to Dad, and it didn't seem to scare Dad, so mm -hmm. it didn't scare me. Um, that was probably naive not to be scared. <laughs> well, I had one, and they talked about how they were going to murder we children and what we would look like and our parents would find us and everything. And I told it to Dad, and Dad said, don't worry about that. People that call you on the phone are too chicken to come and do anything. Right. Right. And so his being bold and brave right. about it sort of made us feel. Right. I was worried about him sometimes. We had, we had a driveway with a garage and a hedge, and there were some dark spaces, you know. So I was worried a little bit about him sometimes, but not about us. We looked back at his diary, and he was at meetings 300 nights out of 365 for just straight, and sometimes two or three meetings. And my mom would be uh, kind of keeping the, the, you know, us with right. the homework going, and, and she would just explain that this was important work and it was good work. Uh, yeah, I remember in particular in the archives, you'll find a, a piece of uh, paper where they had pick, cu uh, cut out a picture of a man who'd been bloodied and beaten, and it, you know, in cutting out the letters, it said, uh, "This could happen to you," and that one scared me. And uh, Dad, again, like to you, he said, these people are cowards. Don't worry about them. <laughs> and, and the Nazis put a whole pamphlet out yeah. on Dad yeah. and stuck it under everybody's windshield wiper at church when we came out. And it was talking about how he should be hung in front of the Supreme Court house and that sort of thing. So it felt real. Yeah. It felt like people were angry about it. Um, all this time that your dad was so busy on the school board, he also had another job, didn't he? He, he did. <laughs> he did. Tell, us about, tell us about his day job. <laughs> what, what was his day job? Well, it, it follows through with his, with his interest in education. He, mm -hmm. he first came to Washington. He always told us one of his lessons of life is you have to have a marketable skill. Yes. And his marketable skill, because, you know, he, uh, after all, he, he lived through the Depression, his marketable skill was typing. He was a really good typist. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and so he came to Washington originally to be a clerk for the federal government and then moved up and discovered a real interest in human resources and then in training. And what he was was a, a training specialist for the federal government. He designed programs to train other public officials. He was the chief of training for the 1950 United States Census. We children still all remember that he would bring home the film strips right. that were to be used to train the enumerators. You we know, we were trained. <laughs> he figured if those little kids could understand the film strip, maybe my enumerators could figure it out. <laughs> and so and so he worked for various agencies: the State Department, um, the General Service Administration, the Census Bureau, um, the Postal Service. Postal Service. Postal Service. Yeah, set up the Postal the Service Institute out there. Training in, Institute yeah. in Maryland. Yeah. So education was always the thing that he was interested in. And I would say um, he was very proud of his professional career. Uh, he served as the professional organizations that tied together training specialists from around the government. Uh, he published a couple of books about his subject matter. Um, and I think he felt very good about that. But he would absolutely tell you the thing in his life he was most proud of 
aside from a few tennis victories. But the same thing he was most proud of was his service on the Arlington County School Board. That yeah. was that yeah. was what he felt was, if you will, a calling. Um, and it, it wasn't easy having uh, the federal job as well as the other, right. because the federal government wasn't crazy. There was this guy named Hoover, you know, <laughs> and they, they were, and, and I think still, if we did a FOA request, we would find our, our phone was clearly tapped, but there, there was this feeling that you shouldn't, you know, get real active in these political things. And so at some point, um, there was a loyalty oath proposed by uh, the folks that were very, very conservative on the board. They were going to make every teacher sign a loyalty oath so we could be sure there weren't any communist teachers. And my dad, I think, was the sole vote against it. And he went into work and they said, is, you know, his boss called him in and he said, does this mean you're a communist? You know, you're, you're uh, definitely going to have to explain this. And so dad said to him, I voted against it because one, they're only, it's only applying to teachers. It doesn't apply to administrators, bus drivers, anybody else that, you know, is unfair to teachers. And secondly, it's not going to do any good because if they are, they're going to lie, right? <laughs> so, and, and in spite of that, he, and he said to his boss, I want you to do a full investigation of me. I want the whole thing, you know, find out when and if I ever was. And I'll tell you right now, I never was. And so they, they did a full investigation and he was cleared, of course. And, <laughs> but it, it, I think there were, you know, strifes between the two occupations. And there were moments when he thought he would lose his job. They really were. Yeah, which would have been very hard uh, yeah. on the family economically. Right. And it, speaking of that, we should mention that we don't say mother's name a lot, but she was such a part of this. Yeah. She, you know, not only did she do everything like mimeograph things and type, you know, labels and that sort of thing, but he could never have done what he did without her, yeah. you know. So in every sense, in em every emotionally, sense. physically, Absolutely. logistically, morally, morally. Yeah. Yeah. Right. because every time he had to take some tough, courageous stand, uh, we know she was right there saying that's exactly the right thing to do. Yeah. You should absolutely do that. Um, and, and, um, and she would cite all kinds of support for why he was doing what he was doing. So she was very, very important to him. What was your mother's name? Nadine. Nadine Johns. What was your maiden name? Johns. J-O-H-N-S. You just touched on the cross burning. I wonder if you all could tell us your memories of that. Uh, it, it was dramatic, but it was short-lived. Uh, to my knowledge, we never found out who did it. It just, we looked out the window at some point, and there it was burning away. Um, and uh, I don't remember, Dad went out and put it out, I guess? or I think so. I think Dad went out and put it out and threw the stuff in the trash can, and that was the end of that. And I think, I think probably, I can't quite remember this, maybe Janet does, but he probably came in and said one of these same statements about people who do things like that and run away are cowards and we don't need to pay any attention to them. Um, yeah. It's pretty intimidating still. Yeah. <laughs> well, and uh, it, it, I don't know what his heritage in Texas might have been about those kinds of hate activities in Texas. That he. he I, I never heard any stories like that, but probably he wouldn't have told us any if, he, if there were some. But there certainly is a heritage there that might have caused him to be scared um, that, that at least we never heard about on, on our end. Did, uh, did any of you, or probably all of you, have the experience of being in an integrated classroom? It's, it's an interesting, you should ask that question from this side to that side. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I went to Washington, I graduated from Washington in 1960. The fall of 1959 was the first moment when they were, were eligible for, to be... Oh, you should know, if you haven't seen this, one of Dad's very interesting uh, diagrams for us early on was the school districts when he first came to the school board. <laughs> there was a small community of black people that lived in the northern part of the county around, called Halls Hill. A small community that lived in the southern part of the county called Green Valley. As you know, most of Arlington is, is east-west roads running over to the district, and it's, we'll leave roads one big south station, more south road. 
So there was enough black people in the north to have an elementary school up there, and enough black people in the south to have one there. But there weren't enough junior, senior, high school age kids in either part of the county to have a school. So they built a junior, senior high school in the southern part called Hoffman Boston, and drew the district for that school around the uh, community halls hill, probably gerrymandered right around the lot where black people. Right. Were. And then it went down um, one side of Glebe Road Glebe for Road. five miles, <laughs> around Green Valley, and back up uh, the other side of again. Glebe Road. <laughs> it was the most dramatic bar bill you've ever seen. So uh, the, the short story is my class had one African-American student that joined us in January of my senior year. And I know it will come as a shock to you that he didn't graduate on time with us. He graduated later in the summer, as I understand it. So when our class graduated, it was 1,000 white kids. Um, so I never had the experience in high school or college <laughs> of being in a classroom where we're also black kids. Right. Ruthie? There she's, were, she's I'm one year two behind. Year, two yeah. years younger than me, but so much smarter than me, she's only one year behind in school. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I think there might have been four black students in my graduating class of 1,000 at Washington Lee High School. <laughs> and the now, young spring chicken. 30 percent. 30 percent. People of color. In well, my your dad won. Washington. Yes, your dad yes. Won. And, th and this is so, what, seven years? Seven years. Seven this years. is not. Seven years. Yeah. And all, um, as, as, as you will hear in a later tape from my wife, and all in a peaceful manner. That was um, so important to these people. They had seen Little Rock, and it hadn't been long before. And the black activists and the white activists said, we are not having Little Rock. We are going to do this and do it right and do it without violence. And that happened. And that happened. And my father was the only member of the school board who attended that morning to see it because he wanted to see how it would transpire. The others stayed home in a way. They were afraid there would be violence. But, yeah. but uh, my sister-in-law should be sitting here. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> we'll right. meet her later. We'll yeah. meet her. Yeah. But she was there that day, so, yeah. Well, thank you, family of James Stalker. <laughs> we appreciate your, your spending our time, time, time with us today, and also we appreciate your donation of your father's papers. Um, and we and wonder if there's anything you'd like to say. Anything else you want to say <laughs> before we talk to your sister-in-law? I, I I would just say that the one thing in the in the boxes of materials that I loved that I that I always focused on and Dad said it was his one of his favorite things too was a handwritten note kind of a scrawl not all well spelled that of a piece of paper like this that was on his desk one morning when he went into work and it said God will help you work on oh. <laughs> and so someone had done that yeah we're delighted that that this project and GW have, have agreed to, to hold Dad's papers. We hope they'll be useful for people. Um, uh, it, it, we know a good deal, not everything of course, but we know a good deal about the national leaders of this movement and how important and critical they were to this. But for this kind of social change to happen, it is important for there to be local people who decide to be a little courageous, decide to be bold, decide that change is important and that they can lead the way to that. So we hope that your archives will contain the stories of many of the people that, that, that made this happen at the local level. Uh, because that's the kind of courage um, that we need for social change continuously. And as, as we <laughs> go through courage. each of the changes <laughs> that we're asking Very timely. For, yes. Uh, <laughs> exactly right. So we're grateful that you all are going to make this you, available in a way that will, uh, I think it's fair to say that um, we might have read about this person from afar, but uh, Dad was our hero, even, even if he was our dad. <laughs> he would have been our hero regardless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. That was wonderful.